Dear Naughty Dog, Hi, it's me, Austin. How freaking good is The Last of Us on HBO? Uh, seriously, I, I thought I was done with premiere television after Game of Thrones censored the bed in season 8, but holy crap am I ready to be heard again because this show is extraordinarily freaking good. My betters at YouTube inform me that I can't spend forever ranting about random nonsense at the beginning of videos because it hurts viewer retention, so I'll just have to leave it at that and get started with our episode, which is about how the fungal parasite pandemic as portrayed in The Last of Us could actually happen and, in fact, has already begun. <laughs> no, that can't be right. I'm uh, sorry. I must have misread it. Let me just go back again and get back to take take two, everyone. Sorry. I misread it. Anyway, <clears throat> the fungal parasite as portrayed in The Last of Us could actually happen and, in fact, has already begun. Now that's that's what I said the first time. Yep, uh, there there it is, right there in the script. Are, are we sure we got this right? This is the makes no sense show, not the scare everyone half to death about things that could really happen show. All right, I'm being informed by my writer, who is me, that I did indeed read this part of the script correctly. So um, that's horrifying. Excuse me while I go hyperventilate and prepare myself mentally, because trust me, fungal infections are not fun. <laughs> I should be clear from the get-go that the cordyceps fungus, as shown in The Last of Us, actually can't happen the way it happens. Uh, 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 probably. Not overnight like it does in the show. The fungus that it's based on is a real family of fungi that exists- is it fungi or fungi? There are so many asides in this episode, I'm only, what, I'm like two I'm not even two minutes in, I can't stay on script, I'm just yelling in the booth! I'm gonna say fungi for this episode, and you're just gonna have to just freaking. Just deal with it, okay? The fungus that it's based on is a real family of fungi that exists in our world. Its spores exist in food and float in the air and latch themselves onto arthropods, which, fun fact, I misspelled as anthropod at first, which almost led me to leaving a trivia fact in here that anthropod actually means human-like, which is not what anthropods actually are. But, uh, it's arthropod, not anthropod, so, um, so there you go. A fake trivia fact for you. Actually, you know what? We're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. There's a lot of moving pieces here, so we gotta talk first about what a fungus actually is, because it's kind of vitally important to understanding what is even going on and what makes fungi different from, say, plants, bacteria, and viruses. And I, I think a good first step toward wrapping our heads around this is to look at something we very rarely talk about here on this show, but is extremely valuable when trying to understand biology. Taxonomy. Taxonomy is actually pretty easy to understand because it's just it's just categorizing stuff. Living stuff, mostly. I'm sure we can all agree that it's pretty easy to say that there are things that are alive and things that are not alive. And yes, viruses, I see you over there. Sit down and shut up. We're keeping it simple today. Anyway, once you can decide whether something is alive or not, taxonomy is the way that you organize and classify different types of living things based on their evolutionary relationships with one another. Think of it like a big library, where instead of books, we have animals and plants. Just like how books are organized by author, title, and genre, scientists organize living things into different groups based on their similarities and differences. These groups start with the biggest group, called a kingdom, and get smaller and more specific, like phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Each living thing belongs to a group at each level of classification, and the groups at each level get more more and more specific. This helps scientists understand the relationships between different types of living things and how they evolved over time. Let's take a look at the seven different kingdoms, the mostly biggest category that matters. There's, to date, seven of these, although the six kingdom model is still sometimes used. Bacteria, arc, 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 this one, protozoa, <laughs> Chromista, Planty, Fungi, and Animalia. Animalia, or the Animal Kingdom, is where you find, well, animals, bugs, spiders, fish, humans, the list literally goes on forever. It might seem easy at a glance to tell whether something is an animal or not, but you can actually only fit into the kingdom if you fit most of these criteria. One. 
animals are multicellular. Two, animals are heterotrophic, meaning that they have to get their energy from eating other stuff. Three, animals usually reproduce sexually. Four, animals are made up of cells that do not have cell walls. Five, animals are capable of motion. And six, animals are able to respond quickly to external stimuli as a result of nerves, muscles, or both. But let's get to the weird stuff now. Fungi, since that's the main topic of the video. Kind of amazingly, fungi are almost defined by what they aren't rather than what they are. This is to say they are life that doesn't fit into the other categories of life. That said, just like animals, they do have qualifiers that they have to hit in order to be considered proper fungi. They are eukaryotic, meaning their cells have a defined nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles. This is as opposed to prokaryotic organisms like bacteria. They are also heterotrophic like animals, meaning they obtain their food by absorbing nutrients from other organisms. They can obtain food by absorption or by breaking down organic matter with enzymes. Three, they lack chlorophyll, meaning that they are not able to make their own food through photosynthesis like plants. Four, they have a cell wall made of chitin, cellulose, or other polysaccharides different from the cellulose cell walls in plants. Five, they reproduce by spores rather than seeds or eggs. Fungi reproduce by releasing spores which grow into new individuals. You see, while you may think mushroom when you hear the word fungus, if you look at the qualifiers here for what makes a fungus a fungus, it covers a broad range of organisms on our planet. Many of them have nothing to do with mushrooms. You see, a fungus that produces mushrooms is just one type of fungus, and what we call mushrooms, these little cap things, aren't even the entire organism itself. This is just the fruiting body that creates and distributes spores into the air so that they can become new fungal bodies. The entire fungus that makes a mushroom is actually buried below the ground or in a rotting tree or whatever the fungus happens to be eating at the time. This is one of those it's just the tip of the iceberg things. Underneath a mushroom you will find what's called mycelial strands, which are these kind of white spider webby strands that stretch out and look for things to eat. They can stretch really far. Miles and miles in some cases. Funguses can be anything from mushrooms to yeast that are used to make beer and bread to, yes, the cordyceps fungus. To think of all fungi as mushrooms is kind of like thinking that every animal in the animal kingdom is closely related to the donkey. It's just, it's just not true. All right, so we've gone over what a fungus is, so what is the cordyceps fungus? Well, remember how one classification of fungi is that they're heterotrophic? Well, this means that they cannot make their own food, but rather have to get their nutrients from other sources. The cordyceps fungus, or more specifically the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis fungus, gets its nutrients from bugs. Specifically, in the case of this one species, it's ants. But there's different species of cordyceps that parasitize all sorts of arthropods. Either way, the life cycle is pretty simple. Spores from the cordyceps fungus get into an ant and take hold. They then start to spread. They multiply, eating the ant alive from the inside out. Eventually, the fungus hijacks the ant's nervous system and floods it with hormones that essentially drive it crazy. Ants are usually very keenly aware that they are prey animals, so they try to remain discreet and on the ground whenever they can be. But the cordyceps fungus overwrites this instinct and instead fills the ants with the desire to climb. So they climb. Up and up and up they climb to the top of trees where they sink their mandibles into leaves and hang there, ready to die. And they do die. The fungus spreads so completely that it devours all there is to absorb inside the ant and it sprouts a fruiting body out of the head of the ant. This fruiting body then spreads spores, which in turn will infect more ants and around and around the cycle goes. This is the very fungus that is supposedly the cause of the cordyceps brain infection in The Last of Us. And it's never ever, 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 ever going to infect human beings the way you see in the show and the video game. Why? Because we are not ants. You see, the cordyceps fungus spent thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years co-evolving alongside ants in order to create the perfect conditions for their fungal hijacking of the nervous system. And to be frank, human brains are a lot more complicated than the simple nervous systems of ants. It would take something truly magnificent to hijack our brains so completely. So no, the precise fungal takeover you see in The Last of Us won't happen, what with fungal zombie monsters and all that, but something is 
brewing under the surface, in the dirt, in the water, and in the very air you breathe. And it's something that the TV show itself brings up in its very first episode, in its very opening scene, and it's the one thing that could, and indeed already is, spelling disaster for the human race. I'm talking, of course, about our all-time favorite, global warming. You see, fungi, as a general rule, do not do so well with high temperatures. It's why you see mushrooms growing in cool, dark places, and why you can't get your milk or water too hot when you're making bread, otherwise the yeast will die. Most fungi can only tolerate temperatures up to about 87 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 30 degrees Celsius, which is why, while there's billions of species of fungus in the world, there's only about a couple hundred fungi that can actually make us sick by spreading in our bodies. The spores, quite simply, cannot survive in our bodies. But what if that were to change? What if global temperatures were to rise and this in turn kicked natural selection into high gear? What if fungi across the globe suddenly evolved to tolerate higher temperatures? Well, then that's a whole other ballgame, friends. Suddenly, your body temperature wouldn't be able to save you from the spores floating in the air. Suddenly, you are a walking snack to any fungus with a taste for animal protein. Suddenly, you are not safe anymore. And guess what? This change is already happening. This is the premise set up in the intro to The Last of Us TV show, when those dudes in the 70s are talking about the next potential threat to human civilization. The old guy goes on a rant about Fungi being the next big thing to come at us if average global temperatures were to go up, which is, you know, a thing that's happening right now, undeniably. Then, fungi would be forced to either adapt to higher temperatures or die. What's amazing is that scientists believe that a massive fungal bloom contributed to the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. Dropping global temperatures during that time made the planet overall more habitable for fungi that already existed. Now, there's growing evidence that dinosaurs were endothermic, meaning that they could regulate their own body temperatures, which means they maybe weren't necessarily at risk for having fungi inside their bodies, but that's not the only thing a fungus can attach itself to. No, in fact, fungi love to eat all sorts of things, like plants or dead bodies, both of which are food for dinosaurs. Many funguses are inherently toxic to animal life, so regardless of whether or not there was some leftover plants to eat, if animals accidentally ingested some fungus that had invaded the plants, the toxins inside that fungus could easily have made the dinosaurs get sick or even die. And that's before you even consider that these fungal blooms could drive entire plant species to extinction. Like overnight, a fungus could practically eradicate an entire forest. And this is the real danger presented by evolving fungi. Yes, fungi can invade our bodies and there's already been a marked uptick in immunocompromised people getting infected by recently evolved fungus. And the treatment regimens can be pretty dour. The thing is, fungus has a lot more in common with animals than it does bacteria or even plants, which means a lot of the things that can kill fungus can also kill us. Not always directly either. Sometimes it's just cancer. You know, Cancer! That thing that is wildly fatal! Yeah, most fungicides are violently carcinogenic to humans and other animals. And remember how I said the cordyceps fungus can't turn you into a zombie? Well, that part is true. That does not mean it and fungi like it won't be able to take up residence inside you anyway. And fungi are capable of doing all sorts of terrible things to us. They can make us hallucinate, they can affect our moods, they can poison us, and they can even eat us alive! So even though the cordyceps and fungi like it won't be able to to do to us what they do to insects, their ability to thrive in our microbiomes could still spell disastrous news for humanity and create pandemics unlike anything we have ever seen before. So, while the prospect of incoming fungal infections is a pretty dour one, it's not nearly as dangerous as what is much more likely to actually happen. Worldwide starvation. You see, while there are definitely some fungi that would love to take up residence in our bodies and wreak all kinds of havoc, the real danger is what major fungal blooms could have on our food supplies. Overnight, entire crops of grain could be completely spoiled by rampant fungal invasions, which would render all of the food completely inedible. 
This means no cereal, no plant-based ethanol, and crucially, no feed for livestock. This is something that impacts the very bottom of the food chain and works its way all the way up, affecting everything that is a plant, eats plants, or eats things that eat plants. Which, interestingly enough, is how the Cordyceps fungus initially spreads in The Last of Us. So, doing alright realism-wise for a zombie game. So, no, you're not gonna die from a zombie virus, and you may not even die from a fungal infection in your lungs. You'll just die from starvation. So that's nice, but not all hope is lost. You know the Cordyceps fungus in real life, the one that invades ants and sends them off to certain death? Well, while the ants themselves don't have any real defense against this fungus, there is a natural countermeasure in the world that keeps this fungus from spreading out of control and making entire species of ants go extinct. I'm talking, of course, about viruses. You can come out of your corner now. And in this case, we're talking about specific viruses called phages, which are viruses that prey upon other single-celled organisms organisms like bacteria and some funguses. Studies have shown that phages can infect and kill the cordyceps fungus, thus preventing it from completing its life cycle and infecting more ants. The antifungal viruses are able to infect the mycelium of the fungus, which is the vegetative part of the fungus and the part that infects the ants and eats them alive. Once the phages infect the mycelium, they replicate inside the fungal cells and, eventually, kill the fungus. This means even if the ant dies to the fungal infection, the cordyceps is never able to enter the fruiting body stage and spread more fungus, thus saving thousands, maybe millions of ants from extermination. There are also studies that have shown that the presence of these viruses can alter the behavior of the fungus, making it less aggressive and reducing its ability to infect the ants entirely. So maybe there's hope yet for us in the upcoming tide of global warming. Perhaps a Booming fungal bloom in the future also means a ripe opportunity for a new strain of fungal phages to come in and save the day, thus preventing yet another global disaster from sending humanity into a tailspin. One can only hope. Sincerely, Austin. I have to throw out a personal thank you to my Patreon patrons who have kept this show alive over the years. They stepped in when COVID hit and I was like, the tailspin desperate. My spouse was in grad school. It was a nightmare. We thought we were going to be homeless, but they saved my bacon. And I love and appreciate all of them for that. I will never forget what they did for me. If you want to be a Patreon patron, you can head on over to one of our two Patreons, which is very confusing, but I'm currently blending all their rewards so that everyone gets the same stuff. Um, you can head on over to either patreon.com slash the science or patreon.com slash shoddycast. They, uh, they both work. They all come here and help me stay alive to keep making these shows. They all help keep this show going and this channel going. They are a massive boon to, to what we do here. Um, a special thank you to these people who paid me even extra money to say their names out loud at the end of videos. Talking about Dr. Vem, Michael Madison, Madlad616, Miss Kendra, Ronald Coleman, Alan Hagers, EditAmTP, Artifox, Marissa Resnick, Nick Patterson, and Loretta Mazurf. I'm gonna go and edit this video and get ready for episode three, which will be out by the time this video is out, so I should probably say episode four, maybe even five. Um, uh, we'll fix it in post. It's fine. It's all fine here. Uh, how are you?